Have you ever wondered what it takes to be able to feed a family or multiple families on a garden? Well, today's video, we're going to look at exactly what crops to plant, where to plant them, and how much you need to plant to feed a household. I'm Canadian, and at this point, you need to grow a garden just so you can actually eat fresh fruits and vegetables that aren't frozen or just none at all. And brown slop is like the only affordable thing at this point. If you're new to this channel, here's a little bit of background about me. So I've been gardening since I was five years old with my grandma. This completely launched me into loving the science side of both plant and soil science. So I obviously chased a very expensive piece of paper in that world, which resulted in me getting a Bachelor of Science in Soil Science. And that in turn has kind of spring loaded or launched me into being able to see how food is produced on a mass scale from a farming perspective, as well as on a home base scale. What I'm going to talk about today in regards to what seeds and plants I am planting and the quantities, I'm going to be talking about both raised beds, containers, and in ground. And and if you have the ability to do the method that I'm referencing when I'm referencing said fruit or vegetable, then I would go for it because that is the ideal scenario for those to be grown in. Now, if you don't have access to in-ground and you only have access to raised beds, it doesn't mean it's not possible. I make content on how to grow all the crops in all the scenarios, don't get me wrong, but in a perfect world for maximum yields, this is kind of what you would want it to look like. For me personally, I feed my household, my sisters, my brothers, my dad's and I give a ton of produce away to friends and family and co-workers. It's crazy the amount of food I can produce and not on a lot of land to really, it's not that much in reality. So number one, let's go out to the farm. The farm is a clay loam soil and this soil has been gardened in off and on for the last five years. Last year I didn't put a garden in there, this year I have. And so essentially when I start off this space all the time, every time I rototill it and this rototilling process I usually run it two to three times and I don't just do one round and the reason for that is because the first round usually things are frozen a little bit moist so you get a lot of aggregation and clumping and my goal ultimately is to get a fluff soil now we're going to talk about why here in a little bit on this space of land if I didn't till I would have grass invading the space I don't own the land so I can't put up barriers and walking lanes with straw and mulch or stuff. I don't have that luxury. It's, it's not my property, so I can't be trucking in tons of wood chips and throwing them all over the place. And if you're new to this channel, you probably don't realize this, but I don't really care how you garden. I think that every tool is a tool that should be used at very specific times. And in this case, tilling is definitely a tool that needs to be utilized. You combine hard clay with a working farm where a lot of compaction happens because tractors drive over that space all winter, fall, spring, when nothing's planted in it. And you end up with the perfect recipe for very compacted soil. So after that rototilling process is done, I will take the soil temp. Now the soil temp, I want to be around the five to 10 degrees Celsius because I'm not necessarily putting in warm crops. I am putting in cooler crops. And so because of that, I don't need mega warm soil by any stretch of the imagination. So it is the first week in May and, and I did put a lot of vegetables into my garden in the country. So I started off with potatoes. Now I'm gonna do a dedicated video just to potatoes because I've grown monster potatoes and I want to show you guys the ins and outs of exactly how to grow these ginormous potatoes very easily. So that's a whole separate video on it all. But after that, I went into planting carrots. Now carrots, very similar to potatoes, do thrive best in a very fluffy light soil. So when it comes to the carrots, I will plant them. And this rule goes for anything that grows underground. Potatoes, beets, carrots, turnips, radishes, onions, garlic, anything like that. If the soil has been fluffed via tillage or broad forked or pitched forked or whatever the case is, you don't want to walk on that space at all, exception to this being when you actually go to sow the seeds and then when you go to weed. And when you go to weed, you really need to make sure that there is not water on that soil surface and the, the soil is not moist, otherwise it will result in compaction. So in my case, I did two packages of carrot seeds, which resulted in about three rows. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea as to my spacing, my quantity, all that sort of stuff. Carrots, the reason why I use these is because they can be used for cooking in a number of ways. They can be frozen and they will store in your fridge for literal months, months, no problem whatsoever. They're tasty, they're sweet if you allow them to get a little bit of a freeze or a frost. And so because of that, they are definitely a staple in my house and they do best when grown in ground in a fluffy soil. You can put them in a raised bed, but I find that they don't perform as well in my raised beds. I do believe that may have something to do with heat and temperature of the 
soil getting a little bit higher. The soil in ground, particularly this space, because it is farther north, tends to be a little bit cooler. And that's why I end up with what I perceive to be pretty big, pretty big, healthy carrots. So we have potatoes, we have carrots. Next, we have the beet. So for this one, I did one large harvest package. This is a Canadian company, and it's essentially like two and a half of just your regular seed packs. And I do the Detroit Reds. I used to have a love of Winter's Keepers. West Coast Seeds used to sell them. They no longer carry them, so I can't get my hands on them, but Detroit Reds will do fine in a pinch. And for these, I did around two rows. They tend to not store as well. You can freeze them, you can pickle them, and you can can them. Don't get me wrong, you can do all those methods. But for me, that's a lot of more pro. For me, that's a lot more processing that has to take place. Whereas a carrot, you throw it in a bag with a little bit of a damp paper towel, you throw it in the fridge or in cold storage, and it's good until you want to process it. Beets, you pick it and you have to process it within two to three days. So it's quick. So because of that, I don't grow a ton of beets, but I do grow them because color, flavor, and just something different that's not a potato or a carrot. After the root veg, we start to get into the vines. Now, I'm gonna list out a number of different vines and why I grow them. And each one I grow a little bit different. I do prefer to grow them in ground because of the sprawl that is necessary. When you allow these plants to sprawl and send out their tiller roots into the surrounding soil, and if that surrounding soil is prepped in a way that they're able to access it easily, not through grass and weeds and all that sort of stuff, but just kind of bare ground or ground with some mulch on top, you end up with a powerhouse of a plant because now you've got a lot of greenery that can really sprawl out and get a ton of sun combined with a root system that is continuous continually expanding. So that's why I grow these in ground preferably. Now I do grow these in raised beds as well. And you guys have seen it before. I usually will plant them on the edge of my raised beds and then I will let them come out of the container or out of the raised bed and then go onto the grass, the lawn, and I will allow them to send out tillers and leaves on that lawn space. So for vines, I did do cucumbers and I do both cucumbers in the city and on the farm. The cucumbers in the city are typically like your lemons, your melons, these really unique unique looking cucumbers. Some things that are a little bit more exotic. It's a bumblebee and he wants to get out, but he doesn't want to get out. He's like, it's warm. It's nice. There's flowers in here, but I also don't want to be in here. So, okay, I'm gonna let you go, go, go. There you go, gee. Cucumbers, I will trellis these over, allowing them to spill over the edges. So what this means is I will plant them at the back of one of my raised beds with a metal trellis, whether it's chicken wire or something more sophisticated, and I will allow them to crawl upwards. The reason for that is because of limited space. I want to capture as much sun and air movement as possible. Sun for the purpose of photosynthesis and air movement for the purpose of lessening the potential of powdery mildew. So that's what I do in the city. On In the country, I spread them out as normal. I make sure that they have about two feet between each row. And I will only do early rations or anything that is best for pickling. So not fresh eats, but mostly pickling. And you're gonna realize very quickly that the farm plot is for a lot of stuff that is going to be overwintered and not necessarily eaten in real time. Eaten, eaten in real time. So after the cucumbers, we get into some squash. Now, I personally have tried to grow spaghetti, butternut, on and acorn squash in the city, and I have gotten results. Don't get me wrong, it has worked, but I find my best results are present on the farm in ground. And this, I actually don't row space at all. I will make a mound. I will put three to four seeds inside of that mound, and then I will cover it up. And so in, or in the space of a drought, which is what we're in right now, I will make a concave divot in the ground, put the seeds in, and then put a little bit of soil on top of that. And the idea there is that it's going to kind of act as like a catch, a bin, if you will, and the water will drain into that space if you've kind of set everything up correctly. And that's really important on the farm because I'm not out there to water every day. I maybe get out there once every two weeks. So I do kind of need it to work on its own without me intervening. And one way I do that is through that concave mound and I use that concave mound method with potatoes as well but I discuss that in the potato video in a little bit more detail. So the rows I'd mentioned, the root rows and the rows we'll mention after this, cucumbers included, I will make a divot in this for 
this year, a concave. And so again, it's kind of like a channel. It acts like a gutter that water will filter into. And again, it's just for capture of water. Now we had a wet period years ago and on the farm I did the opposite. So I actually made a mound and I seeded into the mound. The idea being, I wanna get the roots above that potentially anaerobic condition caused by excessive levels of moisture in the soil. Ones that actually don't grow best in the country compared to the city are things like birdhouse gourds, loofahs, zucchini, anything that's a little bit more on the exotic side, pumpkins that need to be babied. So all of like your decorative pumpkins, for example, those actually all do best planted in the city. The only other squash I planted outside of the city was pumpkins. And I only did one or two plants of these. It's one of those things where I will use them for eating purposes, but I'm not heavily invested in them as like a staple compared to something like a spaghetti squash or an acorn or butternut. And these will again store very long term in a cold storage. If they don't make it till basically the next <laughs> the next spring, I'd be shocked. After that, on the absolute back end of this entire plot is my corn. Now, the reason the corn is on the end actually comes down to several different reasons. Number one being it acts as a wind block against the very intense winds that actually will push through that garden. And my first row almost always is nearly on a 45 degree angle, unfortunately. The other reason it's on the end is because I reserve that entire back portion to plant as many rows of corn as possible. Now, I want you to think of it this way. The outside rows of your corn rows, so if you did four rows of corn, the outside two are going to produce one, if maybe none, no ears that actually have corn on them. There's the cobs are gonna be empty or they're not gonna be fully pollinated. The only plants you can expect actual corn from are going to be the inside two. So you can see very quickly why six or eight or you know 10 rows makes more sense because you're going to get a bigger yield. You need a cluster, you need a family, you need rows. Now you can grow corn in the city, but it's not nearly as effective. It takes up a lot of space and you don't get much of a yield because again, wherever there's an edge, the outside doesn't get pollinated, the inside does. So unless you have a lot of space, I would not encourage you going this road. Now something else you could very easily plant would be wheat. And I don't plant wheat because I can get access to wheat whenever I want it as someone who obviously is from a farming family. But if you don't have access to just raw kernels of wheat, maybe something you could consider actually growing. The threshing process and harvesting process really isn't that intense. And while you need a decent amount of room or space, you don't need a ton. So if you had, for example, like 10 to 15 feet wide by 30 to 40 feet long, that would be sufficient enough to give you quite a substantial amount of flour. So it's definitely something to consider. That is it when it comes to the in-ground stuff. That's all that I could grow effectively in a farm, in ground, out in these more Northern spaces. When it comes to basically everything else, it's grown in the city and only grown in the city because that's the only place that these are going to thrive and survive. That, that thing, there's a bird and it's crazy looking and it's like hammering the furnace and I don't know if you can hear that. I don't know if the mic's picking it up, but it's kind of funny. It's like slamming on metal, making music anyways. So in the city, I have very specific stuff I will grow. And the reason for that is because sometimes the intensity of the sun in the farm can be a detriment. The temperature of both ambient and in ground can also have a negative effect on the yield or the crop. So ones that grow in the city are going to be tomatoes and peppers, hands down. If you do okra, eggplant, artichoke, anything like that, that's a bit of a warmer climate plant. I actually heavily encourage you to grow them only in the city or in a space that is a little bit warmer. Now, if you don't have access to, you know, warmer conditions, city above ground, what you could do is actually put them into containers. Just a five gallon bucket is enough to actually sustain some pretty good growth off of a tomato or a pepper. Now, for me personally, I don't put peppers in ground and I don't put peppers in raised beds. I actually only put them in containers because they tend to produce the most pepper hands down when there are these restricted spaces. If I put them in a raised bed or in ground and they have unlimited resources, I find I get a lot of foliage and not a whole lot of flowering and ultimately fruit. That all of my herbs are grown in the city because you need to continually be topping and removing foliage from them to ensure that they don't flower and they will flower if you're not constantly on top of them. The other ones I grow in the city could include 
things like the radishes and the turnips that need to be eaten very quickly. Otherwise they set seed very quickly. So these again are very heavily affected by the really intense sun that you find in the prairies when compared to the city where you end up with a little bit more shade and shelter against these harsher elements. I also do lettuce, uh, spinach, arugula, any sort of leafy green kale. All of these I do in the city and that is because all of these I do in the city and that actually comes down to the fact that they again will bolt in an environment that is the bolt headed prairies whereas in the city I can actually guard them, protect them, and shelter them in some way. My hands down probably most favorite and most utilized in ground row setup that could also be done in race beds but just by sheer volume purposes I do put in ground are going to be beans and more specifically bush beans not pole beans and the reason for that is because bush beans have very high yields they are very easy to pick from and as long as you're harvesting they will continue to flower and you can continue to harvest it is like best possible plant you could grow now you can let these turn into actual beans and then use just the beans or you can cut them before those beans fully form and then freeze them etc and so forth but they're an absolute powerhouse when it comes to having fresh green like if you've ever had a green bean salad it's delicious you can again these you can freeze these you can can these you can pickle these like literally endless possibilities all of which are wonderful possibilities that are one of my most favorite plants to grow now a plant that I never really consider and you're probably wondering why is peas I find that they're too much work for the output that you get now don't get me wrong I think peas are delicious and I think that if you have the time and you can put in the effort to grow these then you should but I personally will only kind of sporadically put them around my garden I actually use them as a signal for when the soil has warmed up enough that I can actually transplant or plant outdoors now the peas themselves the reason why I don't plant them is because on the farm what tends to happen is mice will actually eat the pods and so I end up with half filled pods and kind of gross that mice are crawling all over them and then in the city I have birds that usually pick off the tops for quite a while until eventually they give up and then I just find the yields because they're in raised beds or containers it's just not high enough you need a lot of volume like similar to like a bean plant and so because of that I just don't bother with them but if you had an in-ground space where you could control the potential of like voles and mice and that sort of thing then absolutely go wild they're definitely a good choice now all of this produce results in pounds and pounds of of food I'm not joking at all it is so much that I need multiple trips to and from the city just to bring back example an entire trunk of just squash so because of that I'm pretty confident that if you followed kind of loosely what I'm doing you would definitely be able to feed your family absolute no issues I still have tomatoes in the basement that I need to turn into pasta sauce that are frozen so it's a lot of food and for tomatoes I grow like 50 ish in like my garden 50 to 60 of them and that seems to be way too many for what I need but now one thing you're gonna notice I didn't mention was fruit and the reason for that is because in the city you need a lot of them to be able to make a difference and they're perennials so that means that they are going to continually consume space in your garden so if you don't have it it doesn't make sense to take that space up with perennial fruit plants now the exception to that in the city is actually a raspberry the raspberry I find is very prolific even with not a whole lot of canes so because of that I do do the strawberry or the raspberry in the city on the farm I would love to put more out there however like I said it's a working farm and I my family would definitely drive over in the perennials even if I put a big steak in there they're still gonna probably be in the winter so I don't have anything out there but if I had a choice I would definitely go with has caps Saskatoon berries again two very prolific plants that tend to do well in our harsher climates that produce a lot of fruit now one that I do want to grow in the city and I'm going to try to find this year because I'm going to be redoing some of my yard again is grapes there are some zone three grapes out there they are very prolific they are vines so very easy to grow if you have like a fence or some space to trim in and that is obviously a fruit and if you didn't know this grapes can be frozen and they're delicious frozen so definitely something that I am going to be looking for so other than the raspberries the grapes I only have some strawberries the strawberries are hit and met I don't know if they're really worth the space and the effort but they're there because they're one of my most favorite fruits so but that's my list of all the different crops you should grow if you want to lower your grocery bill effectively without growing things that may not actually reduce your grocery bill and ultimately where they should be planted in an ideal world if you have access to both raised beds containers and in ground gate crew i will talk to you guys next time bye